Well, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. We're in 1 Peter in day two of looking forward to the promise. We're going to be doing devotionals out of First and Second Peter here for these next few days, and we're just excited about what God is doing to speak to us during these days of difficulty all around us. So grab your cup of coffee, the Word of God, your iPhone, whatever you use to pull up the scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and pick up where we left off yesterday. Went through verse uh, 9 yesterday as Peter described this living hope that we have, the beautiful salvation we have in Christ Jesus. And he begins in verse number 10 by saying, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Now, please don't jump over this too quickly. Are you grasping what Peter is saying here? It was the Spirit of Christ speaking through the Old Testament prophets. Say, wait a minute, Christ was already there? Yes, of course, Christ was preexistent. The Bible teaches a trinity, not three gods, but three persons of the living God. And that person of Christ, we are told, is preexistent, even as the creator, Paul tells us in Colossians. And you say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't it say it was the Holy Spirit? Oh, wait a minute, there wasn't a Holy Spirit till Acts 2. No, the Holy Spirit is also part of the triune Godhead. He's always been around. And yes, the Holy Spirit was speaking in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Remember, uh, Jesus, when he was discussing with his disciples what was about to take place, he said, I'm going to go so that I can send him, the Holy Spirit. Does that mean the Holy Spirit was never around? Of course not. It's just in a different way, a new way to be manifested. The Spirit of Christ will actually now be able to live inside of you in the church age. So, you know, it's not like the Spirit of Christ wasn't already around. And in the Old Testament, Peter's telling us it was that Spirit of Christ speaking about his own sufferings that were to come. And if you look at the great detail in the Old Testament, we saw some of this in Psalms and Isaiah and some other places of how Jesus was going to suffer for our sins. It was given in such great detail for a reason. It means the Messiah would have to fulfill all of those Old Testament prophecies. No one ever else, no one else has ever come close or even attempted it because so many of those would be out of that person's control. That's why it's so absolutely certain that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. In fact, verse, uh, verse 11 in the Holman Christian Standard Bible says that these sufferings of Christ, uh, that, like the NIV where it says the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow, is phrased differently. It's how these prophets, quote, testified in advance to the messianic sufferings, messianic suffering. In other words, sufferings that would take place in the life of the one who was to come and be the Messiah. So if you think someone else is the Messiah, you have to go back and say, wait a minute, the only way they could qualify as Messiah is, let's get that list of all these sufferings that Messiah is supposed to go through from the Old Testament. Now, who qualifies? Who's been there and done that? Well, no one other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So with this beautiful revelation, it says in verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that had been told you by those who've preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So here we have a couple of other interesting revelations. These prophets knew they were serving people down through the ages that they were laying out this message for. Folks, just like you and I, that are able to read those messages today and have the confirmation that all of this is true and is certain, made sure and positive by the fulfillment of those prophecies, even written hundreds of years, thousands of years before they took place. The greatest of which, of course, is what we're basing this entire devotional series on, looking forward to yet future prophecies to be fulfilled and are being fulfilled all around us that point toward the glorious reappearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from this mess we've made of the earth. And so look at what it says. This is happening and is being understood by you. Why? When the gospel is being preached to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven through these people that are preaching. Oh, well, preaching 
Is Holy Spirit preaching? If it's good preaching, yes. You can preach all the wrong ways. Now, trust me, when you're listening to someone preach and share your spirit, the Holy Spirit in you's got to be able to confirm that what you're hearing is really of God. Because it can be a couple of other things. It can, number one, be no spirit preaching. In other words, God's not behind it at all. It's someone rattling off their own opinions and ideas that have nothing to do with the scripture, with the ideas that are uh, listed therein. Secondly, it could even be driven by other spirits. We saw the mystery of iniquity already at work, the uh, this work of lawlessness that's going to be unleashed upon the world. God's not behind that. Satan is behind that. It talks about this as being the works of Satan. So listen, there's a lot of preaching going on out there, but make sure that what you're listening to and absorbing and following is Holy Spirit preaching. It's behind the, so that you know God's behind what you are hearing. Be discerning. Don't just take everything uh, hook, line, and seeker uh, before you understand whether or not God is in this person's preaching. Well, then it goes on and says, even angels long to look into these things. So in verse 13, here's where we are today. And this is kind of the focus of what I wanted to share with you. How do we prepare ourselves to deal with the world around us today? Some of you are dealing with persecution in your own country. Some of you are dealing with the craziness that's going on uh, all around you as it seems like everything's turning upside down, very much as God said it would before Jesus would return. And, and how do you deal with all these, these pulls in different directions? Well, I'm going to give you four steps to prepare for action in these days that uh, looks to me to be evident in this next paragraph. Peter giving it to us, I think, is as applicable today as it was the day in which he wrote it to a church that was facing the persecution of the Roman Empire under Nero. So look at verse 13. Therefore, because of this great salvation you've got, all this, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in your life that God's made available to you. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you have when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Four simple steps in that passage of scripture. Might make a good Sunday school lesson or a message, by the way, okay? Number one, you got to get control. You have got to get control. You can't be out of control and serve God. Self-control is such an important aspect in the New Testament. It's listed several times as a positive virtue for you to have. It's even listed as part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 saying that if the Holy Spirit's in control of your life, you will be in control of yourself. So you can't have the excuse, why did you do that? Why did you commit that dastardly crime or that awful sin? Well, I was just out of control. <laughs> oh, I was high. Okay, well, you shouldn't have been smoking a joint anyhow. Yeah, I mean, listen, we've got all kinds of excuses for why we did something wrong. Peter is saying control shouldn't be one of them. Get control. Self-control is something you can have by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's one of the signals that the Holy Spirit's in control of your life. If you are way too prone to just flying off the handle, as we say in the South, uh, losing control, having fits, saying things you know you shouldn't say, and having to apologize later, it might be because you've not allowed the Holy Spirit each and every day to come in and take control, to invite the Holy Spirit in all his fullness to fill you and to be the person that drives what you're doing that day. It's his agenda, not yours. Instead, you want to be on the throne yourself. You'll just kind of kick Jesus off and say, this is my day and I'm going to do what I want to with it. Well, you should say this is the Lord's day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it and let's let him direct what we're going to do today. Let's prayerfully walk with God today and allow the Holy Spirit to have control and thereby you will have self-control. And trust me, it means you won't have to fall into all that uh, grief and regret and guilt over having lost control. Secondly, we need to get control and then we need to set our hope. Set your hope on what? 
Well, he tells us that we've got to get our hope past those temporal things that will let us down. Listen, yeah, you want to hope in the next politician you can elect to office. Yeah, that's good. You want to hope in the next uh, leader that's going to take over your local public safety department, if you still have one by next week. And, you know, you really want to hope in some of these things that are temporal. You want to hope your uh, retirement account is going to go up and the stock market will go up. But you know, if you really have your primary hope in all those things, when they fall apart, what do you have left? He says, listen, you've got to set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Listen, if you have your hope pointing toward the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has prepared for us and who he is to us, then when these other things shatter and fall, you don't fall apart with them. Set your hope. Set your hope on Jesus and his return. Thirdly, don't conform. Don't conform. So what he says is obedient children don't conform to the evil desires you had when you were living in ignorance. And the world wants you to conform. Today, they want you to line up and get in lockstep with whatever their description of political correctness or, or something else is. And, and everybody's trying to control you from the coronavirus outbreak to these folks who are trying to come up with some kind of new normal that means subtract Christianity from your life or all the love you might have had for your ancestors or anything else because you've got to conform to this new way of thinking. You know, it's, it's George Orwell's 1984 all over again. Friends, don't conform. Be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. That's the kind of life you need to be living. When you live that kind of life, it'll help you to not only see past some of these things that are going on, it'll even help you to love crazy people. <laughs> and what I mean by that is the people who are trying to drive you in the wrong direction. It'll help you to not only deal with them in a positive, hopefully restorative way, It'll help you, as Jesus even pointed out, to love your own enemies. But friends, don't conform. Be transformed by the word of God. And then finally, this is a tough one for us. Be holy. Be holy. We really don't want to read this verse, do we? Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Is this really what God wants of us? He's not saying this is the standard by which I'm going to save you. I'm not going to save you by your works. But see, what he's saying is I've given you the power to live a holy and righteous life. That Holy Spirit within you will allow you to do that. You do not have to apologize for just being what I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But sometimes when we say that, then we just get down and say, yeah, you know, I'm going to sin a lot to do. Thank, I'm going to sin a lot today. So thank God for his grace. Oh, you know, for some of us, we have no goal. Our goal seems to be, well, I'm going to be about a 40% Christian. See how much I can sin on the flip side. And then when I get to heaven, hallelujah, look at all that stuff God forgave in my life. Now, that is just the wrong objective. Don't you understand? I mean, if you really love the Lord, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. If you love me, you'll want to do what I say to do. The goal is holiness. The goal is righteousness. And for this day, the goal is not to see how many sins I can chalk up, that I can pray and ask God for forgiveness for at the end of the day. The goal is to live for God today, to be holy and righteous and to demonstrate how you can live by the power of God in this day. So friends, listen, if you set a low goal or no goal, well, you know what'll happen. You'll even fall short of that. But folks, if you set your goal on God's holiness, you're a whole lot more likely to live a good, a holy and a righteous life today. And yes, when you slip up, and you will, and I will, then you can grasp that grace of God. You can seek and find his forgiveness and the restoration of fellowship and rejoice in your salvation that allows you to do that. But friends, we've got to be set apart as godly people with godly lifestyles, showing and demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to live the way we're supposed to live, not to make excuses for why we can't. That's holiness. So friends, get prepared for action. Get control in your life. Set your hope upon Jesus, his return. 
Don't conform. Be transformed by the power of God and his word in your life and be holy as best you can. No guilt trip on that. Okay, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you. I'm trying to say set your goals high. If you don't set them high, you definitely will miss the logo, even the low goals every time. Let's be all God wants us to be in these days so we can stand out as beautiful stars of light against the backdrop of wickedness and evil. Let's make a difference in this world. We can only do it if, as, Paul, as Peter says here, if we get prepared for action and get on the front lines. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. We'll do this again tomorrow as we wake up in the Word.